Oh, well, th thanks, thanks, Denise, and kia ora tato. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce um, Professor James uh, Renwick as his official title, but he answers to Dr. James Renwick, or just James, so we'll, we'll dispense with the formalities. Uh, so James has had uh, nearly four decades of experience in weather and climate research. His main field is large-scale climate variability and climate change, including such things as El Nino, the southern hemisphere westerly winds, uh, and the impacts of climate variability and change on New Zealand and the Antarctic. Uh, now James is one of New Zealand's leading climate scientists. He's also a leader in international climate science. Now James was the lead author for the last two assessment reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And if you're not sure what that is, it's a United Nations uh, body uh, which is set up as the International Authority on the Science of Climate Change. Uh, so James um, uh, is a convening lead author for the new sixth assessment of the um, IPCC, which is the next uh, assessment of where we are as a world in terms of our global emissions and emission reductions. And he was recently awarded the Prime Minister's uh, 2018 Prize for Science Communication. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. James Rumick. Well, kia ora. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming along, and thanks for the lovely introduction, Roger. And it's a real privilege to be here this evening. You know, I. I you might guess, having won that award, I like the sound of my own voice. Every opportunity to speak in front of an audience, I tend to take. Um, so here we are. Um, title of my presentation tonight, Climate Emergency, So What? And we've heard a lot in the media lately about different um, regional authorities, some of which are declaring an emergency, others who aren't, some who are saying, well, it's just tokenism, you make the statement and then nothing happens. You know, and anyway, my subtitle here, what's so urgent about all of this? And what, what would it mean if we take this on board, if we want to stop global warming in its tracks, what do we actually have to do to make that happen? So that's, that's the, the guts of my talk tonight. Um, and if you're on Twitter at all, that's my handle down the bottom there, Cuba Raglan Guy. I'll explain to you why that's my Twitter handle later on if you want to have a chat. Um, and I'm at Victoria University, that's my email address there. Okay, so, starting off with, um, with the basics of the climate science, I always like to start with this, with pretty much every audience, just to make sure we all understand what's going on. So, that, you know, the, the basics of climate change, as it's happening now, is, is pretty straightforward. So the first point is that all of the energy in the climate system comes from the sun. So I think we all know this from probably primary school or high school. Um, science, uh, solar energy, sunlight, that powers the weather and the climate over the whole globe. But the thing about sunlight is that uh, the atmosphere, the air around us, is basically transparent to sunlight. So apart from the bit that's reflected away by clouds and so on, the, the sunlight shines through the air and it doesn't warm the air at all, it, it warms the earth. So the, the sunlight that's not reflected is absorbed at the surface of the earth, so the earth warms up. And so it radiates energy just like the sun does. Because it's a lot cooler than the sun, it radiates much less intense energy, what we call infrared uh, or, or heat, what our bodies radiate, essentially. Um, and the atmosphere is not transparent to that kind of energy. There are gases in the air that absorb infrared radiation very efficiently. And these have become to known as greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, water vapour, methane. You know the drill, you've heard about them in the news, I'm sure. So because these gases are there in the atmosphere, the air warms up as well. So it radiates heat just like the Earth does. And eventually enough gets back out to space to balance the sunlight that's coming in. But in the process, some of that heat from the atmosphere is radiated downwards as well to the Earth's surface. So the Earth is warmed from two different processes. One, directly from the sun, and second, from the heat that the atmosphere contains. It's very like having a blanket on your bed at night. You know, if you're lying in bed at night and you're cold, you put a blanket over yourself, that blanket captures some of the heat that's radiated from your body, keeps it under the blanket, keeps you warmer. You put on a second blanket, 
and that keeps you warmer again. It's exactly the same idea. You put more greenhouse gas in the air, that's a, big, a thicker blanket on the earth and the earth's surface, what's underneath gets warmer. That's, that's as basic as that. Well, you take greenhouse gas out of the air and that cools down the surface of the earth. So that's it. So if you want to change the climate, you either make the sun brighter or dimmer, or you change the amount of greenhouse gas in the air. That's, that's basically the two things that control the surface temperature of the earth and control the climate. Over the last um, century and more, the amount of sunlight uh, falling on the earth really hasn't changed very much. It's gone down a little bit in the last 50 years or so. But the amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere has gone up hugely. And we know this is from human activity, um, from the chemistry of the air. We know that the carbon that's going into the atmosphere has been away from the fresh air, away from sunlight, away from cosmic rays and so on for a very long time. So the radioactive component of the carbon has all um, decayed away. So the radio, there's a very tiny radioactive component of carbon in the atmosphere and that fraction is going down. So we know that what's being added is from fossil sources. We know that basically it's mostly the burning of fossil fuels, coal and oil and gas, that's causing the increase in um, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So let's have a look at that. Um, here's the change in carbon dioxide in the air over the last um, 13,000 years or so. Uh, so the, the different colours on this graph, we've got time along the bottom axis there in, in years, starting about uh, 12,000 years ago, and the amount of carbon dioxide in the air uh, up the vertical axis in parts per million. So this is, you know, it's a tiny fraction of the atmosphere, but it's a very important fraction. It, it's part of what does this absorbing of the heat in the air. So we've got three different sources for this information. The green and the red parts of the curve are um, little bubbles of air from uh, ice cores in Antarctica, and then the blue part, the end part, is from direct measurements of the atmosphere in Mauna Loa and Hawaii. So there are a number of stations around the world that measure the amount of carbon dioxide in the air. There's one of them at Bering Head, out at the heads of uh, Wellington Harbour, and that's the longest running site in the Southern Hemisphere. But um, the Hawaiian site started considerably earlier, back in the late 1950s, so that's the, the one a lot of people use. So uh, the reason I show it like this over 13,000 years is that's because this is the time scale that the Earth operates on. If we stopped emissions today and we let natural processes take their course, it would be about 10,000 years before that spike comes back down to where it was two or three hundred years ago. And it's also the sort of time scale it takes for a major ice sheet to melt or refreeze and it's roughly, it's probably a bit longer, but it's thousands of years that it takes the deep ocean circulation to adjust to big changes in, in the energy content. So we've made this change in the last couple of hundred years, but um, which seems like a long time to us. But in terms of the way the Earth works, it's, it's the blink of an eye. And it will take a very long time to bring things back to where they were before we got started with the Industrial Revolution. So um, we've had this, this big spike, effectively, in carbon dioxide concentration. And I talk about carbon dioxide because it lasts so long, hundreds of years, thousands of years. Uh, other gases uh, react out or fall out of the atmosphere much more quickly than that. Um, we've had this increase from about 280 parts per million to about 410 parts per million now over the last 250 years or so. But it hasn't just been a steady increase. It's very hard to tell from the way I've drawn this graph. But the, the first half of that increase took about 230 years, roughly speaking. And the second half of the increase took 30 years. So the rate of emission of greenhouse gases has been going up exponentially. And in fact, through the period the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been in existence and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, that's when the biggest increases in greenhouse gas emissions have occurred. So that's roughly the last 30 years, and we've had half of the emissions over the last 250 in that time. So in the time that the globe started talking about containing climate change, we've actually gone in totally the wrong direction, and emissions today are roughly double what they were back in the late 1980s. So the amount of carbon dioxide in the air now is obviously higher than it's been for quite some time, more than 
uh, 13,000 years. In fact, it's been about 3 million years, roughly, since we had this much carbon dioxide in the air. So the composition of the air that we're breathing tonight, the Earth hasn't seen this since before humans evolved. So as far as our experience goes, this is completely uncharted territory. Anyway, this, this spike, this is our thicker blanket of greenhouse gases on the globe, and like you'd expect, the globe is warming up. So here's a graph of global average surface temperatures. So what we've got here is along the bottom time, this time starting in 1880, not, not thousands of years ago, and the vertical scale is temperature, where the zero is taken as our best estimate of the average temperature in the period from 1880 to 1900, so before the beginning of the 20th century, which is our best guess, or not guess, pretty good estimate of the pre-industrial temperature back in the 1700s. And you can see, you know, there are ups and downs, and then around the middle of the 20th century, temperatures really started to increase. And the last five bars on the graph, and the last one on the graph there is actually this year, it's the first six months of this year. If 2019 continued as the first six months of the year did, we would have a temperature of about 1.2 degrees above pre-industrial. Uh, June, the last full month on the, the graph, was the warmest June on record globally, and July is expected to be the warmest July on record globally, so every chance that <coughs> the whole year will come in is at least as warm as that, 1.2 degrees. So the, the last five years, including this year, have all been more than a degree above pre-industrial. The average is about 1.1 degrees above pre-industrial. So um, this is the first hint that this business of stopping the warming at 1.5 degrees which is what the zero carbon bill's about and so on, uh, we don't necessarily have a lot of time if we're already at 1.1 and we warmed up about a degree in the last century. And that increase in greenhouse gases has been exponential in the last, especially in the last 30 years or so. Anyway, that's, that's the story with air temperatures. Um, but the warming of the air is actually a tiny part of the story. So the, the air absorbs all this infrared energy, but either it sends it out to space or it sends it back to the Earth's surface and it gets absorbed at the surface of the Earth. And the Earth is mostly covered in water, so it's the oceans that are doing most of the absorbing of the, the heat. So when you look at it, over 90% of the warming is actually going into the oceans. So the, the part that warms the atmosphere, that's this little sliver down here, uh, but the, the upper ocean and then the deep ocean are taking up roughly 93% of the warming. This is since 1970, so over the last 40, 50 years or so. This is really good news for us because if it had all gone into the atmosphere, temperatures would already have gone up about 50 degrees, so we'd all be dead. It wouldn't be a problem. We wouldn't be emitting greenhouse gases anymore. Um, the downside, though, is that the oceans take hundreds of years to adjust to big changes in the amount of heating and the vertical um, distribution of heat. So we're in for changes in ocean currents and uh, deep ocean circulation for centuries into the future. And like anything, when you warm water, it expands. So the, the ocean's getting deeper. So we, we've locked in sea level rise for centuries to come. It may be quite slow if we stop the emissions soon, but, but it's going to continue for at least three or 400 years, pretty much regardless. So here's a, a quick snapshot of how the sea level is changing. So not only are the oceans getting deeper just because they're warmer, um, ice on land from the ice sheets and from glaciers are melting. So that, that's adding to the sea level rise as well. So again, starting in 1880 through to roughly the present, a couple of years ago, uh, this is global mean sea level, GMSL, in millimetres. The change from the zero being the value in 1880 most of this is from tide gauges, but satellites do a very nice job over the last 20 years or so, and they all line up pretty well. So we've had close on 25 centimetres, 250 millimetres of sea level rise in that time. Um, but it hasn't been, this is not a straight line. It was about a millimetre per year back here, about two millimetres per year here, and it's running at about three and a half millimetres per year at the moment over the last 20 years or so. So the rate of rise of sea level is, is going up, and this is especially because the big ice sheets are really starting to kick in with melting. And the Antarctic ice sheets, if they all melted, have something like 60 metres of sea level rise 
in the ice. So we really want to avoid um, melting too much of the Antarctic ice sheets. Okay, so that's, that's roughly where we're at. We've had a bit over a degree of warming, had about 25 centimetres of um, sea level rise so far, and so on. Um, so just to summarise that, so remembering that as far as we as a species go, the atmosphere is presently in completely uncharted territory. We haven't experienced an atmosphere like this before in our history. And the total amount of energy that the climate system has, that's the oceans, the atmosphere, the ice, the land surface, is changing, it's increasing. And this hasn't happened for something like 15,000 years. So in the time that our civilization has developed, um, over the last 10,000 years or so since the Neolithic Revolution, the development of agriculture, we haven't really had a change in climate globally. Maybe in regional areas, you know, there have been warm periods and cool periods, but the globe as a whole hasn't really warmed or cooled for several thousand years. And this affects everything, basically. The weather every day, even a day like today, beautiful day, um, lovely sunny skies in Wellington, temperatures maybe 13 or 14 degrees, something like that. That's subtly different to how it would have been if we hadn't added this greenhouse gas to the atmosphere and we hadn't warmed the climate. So all of the weather is different now. Often it's quite a benign change, but when there's a storm, there's more energy in the climate system, there's more moisture in the air because the amount of moisture in the air is a function of temperature, warmer air, more moisture. So more rain when it rains, stronger winds, more intense storms, more extreme events, basically. And everything is affected on all parts of the globe. And this, like I said before, this is really an unprecedented point in human history, especially over the last few thousand years. You know, people were around during the ice ages and they had to survive the cold periods and the warmer periods, but we did not have seven and a half billion people on the earth all expecting to be fed. We maybe had one million people on the earth, or a few billion at most. Um, and we didn't have big cities built right near the coasts where it was convenient to sail ships off to trade and so on. It used to be that the tide went up and down every day, but the average sea level didn't change. So you could build, you know, Manhattan could be built right at sea level. We could have large cities like Wellington, like Miami, etc., etc., right down at the coast, and it wasn't a problem. Well, it is a problem now. Sea levels are starting to rise, and that hasn't happened for about eight or 9,000 years. So we need to get our heads around this, and we need to think of ways to, to deal with it. So I think I've, my career has all been about forecasting the future. So I can confidently say we can predict the future of temperatures, of rainfall and so on, if we know how much more greenhouse gas we put in the air. But what the future for society is, I think, is very hard to read. You know, there's all sorts of unpredictable knock-on effects, cascading impacts, this ecosystem falls over, that affects that ecosystem, the bees all die off, whatever, plants aren't pollinated anymore. All kinds of catastrophic impacts could happen and we just don't actually know what a lot of them are. And where you are on the globe affects how quickly your climate's changing and how your climate is going to look in the future. So there's all sorts of equity issues around uh, maybe our part of the world's going to be okay for longer, but people in the tropics are going to suffer more quickly. What obligation do we have to those people in the places that are getting the impacts more quickly to, to help them out? But the crucial thing here is that what the future looks like, how risky it is, how extreme it is, is completely within our control. That big spike in greenhouse gases, we did that. We're doing it right now. It's up to us to decide when we're going to stop doing that. The longer we leave it, the more change, the more extremes, the more expense, the more damage to the global economy, the more damage to society. It's completely up to us when we choose to stop this experiment. Some people say, oh, it's all out of control, you know, runaway climate change, nothing we can do, we're all going to be dead in 10 years. Absolutely not true. We have our hands on the throttle. We can choose when we take our hand off the throttle. It's completely up to us. Easy to say, maybe a little bit harder to do. So anyway, so, so where to from here? Here's our spike in carbon dioxide, the thicker blanket again. So this amount of carbon dioxide gives us about 1.1 degrees of warming. 
Paris Agreement talks about somewhere between one and a half and two degrees of warming, and the Zero Carbon Bill is talking about the one and a half degree end. That's what most people are onto. Now, we had this special report from the IPCC last year that was focusing on that end of the scale. So we know how much carbon dioxide we're putting in the air every year, and because it just builds up, it takes centuries to go away again, we can work out quite easily how much more we need to put in to get one and a half, two degrees, whatever, and how long that would take given the rate that we're emitting this stuff. So one and a half degrees of warming at the current rate of emission, if we do nothing, will be here in about 10 years. Two degrees will be here in about 20 years, by about 2040. Three degrees in about 45 or 50 years, and, and so on. And it just goes on from there. It doesn't ever run away. We might get to 12 or 14 degrees of warming if we burn all the coal, but it would never blow up and go to 500 degrees or anything. It's just a question of where we want to stop. Another way of thinking about it, and this comes back to the zero carbon bill and so on, the amount of CO2 we need to emit, if we just keep going at the current rate, we do that in 10 years, but if we start reducing now, and we get to a 50% reduction by 2030, and then we get to zero by 2050, that's pretty much the same amount of carbon dioxide we'd emit if we just kept going for 10 years. So hence the reasoning behind the zero carbon bill that we need to go to be carbon neutral by the middle of the century and get down to roughly a 50% reduction by, oh, in the next decade, basically. So that's the, that's the task in front of us if we choose to take it up. Um, you might say, well, who cares whether it warms up by one, one and a half degrees or three degrees or, or whatever. Just, just a quick thought experiment. So here's that graph I showed before of the global mean temperature year by year starting in 1880, and I've pushed it into the left-hand side of the graph, and I've stopped in 2016, which is still the warmest year on record, but probably not for much longer. And let's imagine we go to the top of the Paris Agreement range, we get one more degree of warming from the end of last century. So we're up to two degrees above pre-industrial by uh, 100 years from now. This is not a year-by-year -year forecast, but if you take the same numbers, shuffle them around a bit and, and add another degree of warming, then you get a graph that looks like this. So this, this is, you know, statistically speaking, it's plausible. I'm not saying it's exactly right, but it's something like what would happen. So by the end of this period, if I came back in 2119, you'd see a few years that are a little bit below, two degrees above pre-industrial, you'd see a few years that are a little bit above, and the average is around two. And that's 2016, the warmest year on record. So this is saying that, yeah, there'll probably be a few years that are cooler than that in the next 15 or 20 years, and after about 2040, Every year, globally, every year is warmer than the warmest year on record. Every year, this whole climate here is completely unobserved by humanity. We have not lived in this climate, and we're already seeing unprecedented high temperature extremes in places like Europe and the US, uh, massive fires, um, heavier rains than have ever been recorded, and so on. That's with 1.1 degrees. Even with 1.3 or 1.4, we're still in a, we're in a region that we just don't actually know anything about. So you start to see extremes that just haven't been observed before. We're already starting to see those. And CSIRO in Australia tell the Australian government that Sydney and Melbourne should expect days above 50 degrees, the sort of temperatures that we saw in India uh, a few months ago by the end of the century with this kind of warming. So pretty much everywhere we will start to see extreme temperatures, high temperatures that are just beyond anything we've observed. I don't think Wellington's going to be up around 50 degrees anytime soon, but we will even here see temperatures higher than we've ever seen before while there's been human habitation here. Hence, hence partly the urgency, you know, how much, how hot do we want it to get, basically, how high do we want the extremes to become. So in New Zealand, uh, some rules of thumb, some round numbers from a report the Royal Society put out uh, two or three years ago, Two degrees of warming in New Zealand, triple the number of hot days. So whatever you like to call a hot day, 30 degrees C, 25, 35, depending where you live, you would expect three times as many at the end of the century or with two degrees of warming compared to the past. And then the, the drier, the interesting, one of the interesting things about the way the climate's changing, the wet regions are generally becoming a bit wetter 
and the dry regions are becoming a bit drier. So the drier parts of the country, which is the east coast basically, is expected to dry out a bit more through this century. So add a bit less rain on the top of the warming and you get roughly a tripling of the occurrence of droughts. Higher temperatures and more droughts go along with a lot more danger of forest fires. So in the eastern parts of the country, all the way from south of Dunedin right through to East Cape, you would expect, according to the forest um, fire modelling guys at, at the Rural Fire Authority in Sion, uh, roughly half the year would be in either very high or extreme fire danger all up the east coast. So you would expect, this is the shot of the, the fires on the Port Hills a couple of summers ago, you would expect to see more of this kind of thing in the future, especially if we're planting a billion trees. And the one that gets a lot of press, um, but it will take a little bit longer to happen, I think, is sea level rise. So this is, a, this is a road in South Canterbury that was partly eaten away three or four years ago. Um, and as the sea levels rise, it just becomes easier and easier and easier for this sort of thing to happen. Um, these cliffs, these low cliffs, are quite erodible. That's been well known for a long time. But just to make the point that these cliffs are five or six metres high, so the road here is maybe six metres above the present day sea level, which does not protect it from even 10 centimetres of sea level rise. The problem is that the, the road is very close to the high tide mark and the beaches, as the sea level rise, the beaches will stay basically as flat as they are now. So half a metre of sea level rise and the high tide mark comes inland by maybe 50 metres or so. So if your road or your property is within something like 50 metres of the high tide mark presently, by the end of the century, pretty much guaranteed that it'll either have to be moved or the sea will move it for you. So we've had about 20 centimetres in the last 100 years of sea level rise around New Zealand. Um, we've locked in at least 30 centimetres more by about 2060. And how much we get beyond that, again, depends on how much greenhouse gas we emit. The low end of the range is about half a metre and the high end of the range is well, as high as you want to make it, ah, one and a half metres by 2100, two metres by 2150, and it could be several metres if we let big chunks of the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets melt. And even 20 centimetres of sea level rise causes problems in some places. All right, so this is the problem. What, what do we actually have to do if we declare a climate emergency and say we want to stop the warming at one and a half degrees? Um, well, you know... <coughs> We need to do some pretty serious things. We need to decarbonise the economy in New Zealand and around the world, basically. Very easy to say, but the whole of the global economy is built on burning fossil fuels, essentially. So it's, it's a huge shift that we need to take. And remember, emissions have been going up exponentially for decades. Turning them around and going down is no small task. So we need to go to 100% renewable electricity production to start with and then eventually 100% renewable energy production. So all the energy that it takes to drive industry, transport, you name it, all has to be renewable. We need to reduce waste um, significantly, especially in New Zealand. We're really good at, at throwing things away. We need to get on top of that. Increase energy efficiency and just, just be more careful with the energy that we use, essentially. And really, if you think about it, you know, for true sustainability in the very long term, you need to think about stopping all forms of growth. That's economic growth, that's population growth, that's growth in the use of materials. Um, because ultimately it's a finite planet and we cannot have an infinite number of people or an infinite number of dollars in the economy. It just won't happen. So um, this, this idea of donut economics that Kate Rowith, who's an English economist, has put forward is becoming uh, certainly a topic of research and conversation, the idea that there's some sort of minimum amount of resource use that we need to keep ourselves safe and there's some kind of maximum amount of resource use that keeps the climate and the planet stable and we need to find ways to move away from this growth in GDP kind of model of how we live which has been the dominant way of thinking for the last, um, at least the last 30 or 40 years. And on a personal level, on an individual level, I think the best way to tackle this, and it's what's been happening a lot in the last year or so, is this kind of thing. So that IPCC report came out last year talking about 
We've got till 2030 to reduce emissions by half. Greta Thunberg started her climate strike, which inspired the whole school strike for climate movement. <coughs> Extinction Rebellion have come along. There's been a lot more in the media, a lot more conversation about this issue, and this is really what we all need. If you all go home and talk to your family about climate change and the urgency around it, then I'll be pretty happy. We, we need to normalise this conversation because we need huge shifts in global society if we're really going to tackle this problem. I mean, we can choose not to, and a significant fraction of the world's population will be dead in 100 years. I mean, the survivors would have to live with the idea that billions of people died because we didn't act. But that's the choice, so I think we really need to get on with talking about it, thinking about solutions, doing anything we possibly can to um, address the problem. Okay, so, so we're entering a climate that really hasn't been seen on the globe for millions of years. If we leave things very long, we'll be in a climate that hasn't been seen for 50 or 100 million years. And everything around us is changing. All ecosystems, including, <coughs> including this one. Sea levels are rising and that's accelerating. Temperatures are rising, the climate is changing, and all sorts of extreme events are becoming more extreme. So we need to adapt to this, um, to adapt to the changes that are already happening. We need to be pretty nimble about this. As we see different things developing, we need to, to um, respond to that quickly. But coming back to the point that how much change we get is totally dependent on the global society, on us. What we choose to do is um, it defines how much change we get into the future. So the bottom line here is the sooner we stop emitting, the sooner we stop climate change. My final point is New Zealand emits about 0.2% of the global total of emissions. So if we turned off New Zealand tomorrow, no difference to the climate system. So I see New Zealand's role as being, at the very least, an inspiration to other countries. I think if any country can become completely renewable, it's got to be New Zealand. We've got all of these renewable resources, we've got a small population, we've got a an agile, hopefully an agile government, and we can make changes quite quickly. So I would like to think we can do this zero carbon business and we can export the technology and the, te and the policy and the ideas around how we did it and help other countries do the same because if we don't all get on board, we're in big trouble. Right, thank you very much. No, not at all. So, so one of the uh, the advantages of our Monday evening format uh, is that we have a little more time for our speakers, and we definitely have time for questions. Uh, and so, James, I know that you're uh, you're ready uh, to go with uh, responding to questions. So, let's have the first one. Rex. Yeah. Uh, two things. Yeah. First thing, as you pointed out right at the end, New Zealand emits less than two point two percent. <coughs> You're concentrated on what New Zealand can do. If we actually spent the money that we're now spending and going to spend on our climate change in yep. places like Indonesia, India, Pakistan, yep. Bangladesh, well, it, it's been calculated in Scandinavia, the bang for the buck would be roughly 20 times what we can do here. Now, the education of New Zealand is as good, but the rest of it, if we actually help other people improve the world's environment, now that's the first issue. The second is no one talks about the number of people in the world. And it's, I, would, I think there's probably four times as many people on the world. We're heading towards maybe a maximum of nine million and then a billion on the I don't know what right now. But it's many more times than we yep. need for regeneration. Our, our whole DNA tells us we have to regenerate. Our religion tells us we have to regenerate. And that's a conversation we have to have much more strongly worldwide. Uh, absolutely. So starting with the population issue, you're, you're completely right. You know, the population of China today is what the population of the globe was at the beginning of the 20th century. This, we don't really appreciate it, I don't think, because if we don't live all that long and we live, New Zealand is living in this relatively underpopulated country, but yeah, there's a a ton of people in the world today, and yeah, you're right, that the expectation is we'll go to 9 billion or maybe even beyond that. If everybody lived at the New Zealand standard of living, there's already 
you know, we fall short big time in terms of the amount of resources available. So if we're going to maintain a large population, there are some pretty hard questions about do we continue with the sort of inequalities that have existed admittedly for a very long time and maybe that's just the way human society operates. But like I mentioned, for real sustainability, no population of anything can just keep growing. You know, there, there are natural breaks on population growth and if you get a boom in population, there's going to be a crash. There has to be, you know. All sorts of natural forces come into play, whether it's disease or, you know, war, you know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, basically. So I would rather see humanity manage this problem compassionately than just let things happen to us all. Having said that, it's a really hard conversation, right? as you <laughs> will no doubt know. We, as a, as a developed country, we certainly have no right to tell other countries what to do. And like you said, it's a sort of biological imperative, it's built into our religions, into the way of our society works. How we get to a stable population quickly, I, I, it's far outside my expertise, I don't have an answer to that, but certainly... This is doing it for us. Educa yeah, this may do it for us, exactly. Education is definitely a good thing to be doing. So educating women in underdeveloped countries is well known to be one of the best things you can do to help climate change. As for whether we should spend the money we might put into reducing emissions in New Zealand to, in developing countries, um, I, I, I honestly can't say what the cost benefit of that is. I haven't seen the numbers. I wouldn't be surprised if you're right. I guess my response would be we should do both. We should reduce our emissions here and help other countries at the same time. I mean, what the, the potential costs of what we're talking about are, I would say, almost incalculable. You know, we could totally wreck the global economy and a lot of people's lives could be at risk. I think spending more now to avoid that future is worth virtually anything. I'm, you know, I, I completely understand we can't crash our own economy in the meantime and we can't put a lot of people here through a lot of financial hardship for some kind of, it's still a forecast, right? I mean, things are happening, but this possible future of major international grief has yet to come. So I suppose some won't be persuaded until it actually happens. But I think the risks are so large that it, it, it qualifies as a global emergency and I think we should be doing absolutely everything we can. And if that means spending money at home to reduce emissions as well as spending money internationally to help other countries do the same, I don't have a problem with that at all. Of course the answer to that question is no. I mean the climate varies in all sorts of ways and has varied since the creation of the earth. Um, so it's never the case that humanity is responsible for everything that happens in the climate. But we do know that pretty much all of the warming that's happened since the middle of the last century is down to human release of greenhouse gases. Uh, some of the other things you said, well, you know, they're starting off by talking about believing in climate change. I don't believe in climate change. I look at the information, the data, the observations, and understand the physics and the chemistry of the science. And I understand that, you know, the way the climate's changing is a result of, of basic physics. And, you know, it's, I, I have an understanding of it. I don't believe in it as such. It's not a faith thing. It's a, it's a science thing. It's a totally different yeah. way of thinking. Yeah, OK, you're yeah, all right. Um, but this idea that all the scientists thought there was going to be an ice age in the 1970s, that's, that's, that's fake news, to use an unfortunate expression. If you look back, yes, uh, 
There was a story on the cover of Time magazine once in the 1970s, and there were a few papers published in the 70s that talked about that was a period of, of relative cooling. But I think it was something like 10 to 1, the number of papers even then published saying that we're getting warming. So that, that's a story that is actually not true. Um, it's not about orthodoxy, but you know, people point to Galileo. Well, geez, you know, he was this one guy who had this new idea about how the solar system worked, and he overturned the perceived wisdom. I mean, absolutely right. The reason we remember him is because he was right. So there's this huge consensus behind Galileo's ideas. A whole lot of people realised, oh yeah, okay, and that explains this and that, and so that's all in textbooks now. You know, you, you can go against the perceived wisdom and be wrong. Most people are, and they are not remembered historically. The ones who are right are. And it's people like um, uh, John Tyndall in the 1860s, who was one of the first people to recognise that water vapour and carbon dioxide did this business of absorbing heat. And then Cervante Arrhenius, who was a Swedish chemist in the later part, the last decade of the 19th century, who did the first calculations about how much warming you would get if you doubled carbon dioxide concentrations. Those are the Galileos of climate change. And there's this, again, a huge consensus of science behind their ideas. And they remember because they were right too. Yeah, you might think I'm deliberately avoiding using the word methane in New Zealand. Um, but it's a really important issue. So half, roughly half of New Zealand's emissions of greenhouse gases come from the agriculture sector. That's methane and nitrous oxide. And the big controversy, if you like, is around how quickly should we re be reducing methane versus other gases. And that comes down to how long do these gases stay in the atmosphere. Like I said early on, most people in the science community talk about carbon dioxide because it's there for centuries and centuries. So once you put it up there, you can assume it's going to be there virtually forever as far as a new human lifetime is concerned. Methane has an average lifetime in the atmosphere of about, I don't know, 12 or 13 years, something like that. So if you're if the amount of methane that's being emitted into the atmosphere goes down even a little bit, starts to decrease, you're going to see a decrease in the amount in the atmosphere relatively quickly. The, the bottom line here is that in the long term, it's the amount of carbon dioxide in the air that determines how much climate change we're going to get over centuries, how much of the ice sheets are going to melt. Um, so that's why the Zero Carbon Bill and why the IPCC report that came out last year talks about got to get to zero carbon dioxide by 2050, but we can afford to reduce methane much more slowly, so if we get to 40% or so by 2050, that's okay. Uh, nitrous oxide is somewhere in between, it has a lifetime of a century or so, so it's quite important to reduce, but it's a relatively small player. So. Changes in the agriculture sector that would benefit that sector and lead to you know, reduced use of fertiliser and better water quality, all the rest of it, that, that will kind of take care of that problem. But methane is terrifically contentious here because it's, it's, not, it's a political problem, it's not a science problem. From a science community point of view, we understand we don't need to reduce methane so quickly. But a lot of people think that sounds like we're giving the farmers a free ride. These guys don't have to do anything too much. Meanwhile, us poor old urban dwellers, we've got to buy an electric car or pay more for our electricity or whatever it is. And there's this kind of us versus them thing starts happening, and that's, that's not terrifically useful. So I think everybody has to do their bit, and every society certainly has to do their bit. Uh, and it turns out that reducing methane emissions along the lines of what the Zero Carbon Bill is proposing is actually that's quite hard work for the, the agriculture sector as it stands now, especially for the dairy sector. You know, we're really talking about reducing um, the intensity of dairy farming and also increasing efficiency and changing feed and all the rest of it that might reduce the amount of methane a given cow burps out. But it, it, is, it is quite a big ask and I know that um, some 
sectors in agriculture have yeah, are pretty resistant to the, the targets that are in the zero carbon bill, but that's that's a political thing. You know, scientifically speaking, it's not such a big issue because it does reduce naturally quite quickly. If we start to turn down the emissions, then we're going to see a result quite fast within 20 years or so. Whereas with carbon dioxide, we're talking hundreds of years, thousands of years. So we really need to keep the focus on carbon dioxide. Okay. Um, so you mentioned Yep. I guess the primary sort of uh, way that we're going to tackle this problem. Um, I guess I want to just get your broad thoughts on what you see for geoengineering as a potential solution. Ah, so yeah, geoengineering, that's another great Jack, question. Can I repeat that question? Yes, OK. So the question was, you know, I've talked about reducing CO2 and reducing emissions, all that. What about some of the other possible technological solutions, geoengineering? Uh, another great question. So I guess there are two aspects or two, two sorts of components to that. One's what's known as negative emissions technology, that is ways of actually taking carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases out of the air what, now that it's up there. So there's lots of groups working on you know, artificial photosynthesis, sort of electric trees and um, clever use of algal uh, growth and ponds to suck up carbon dioxide. I got an email the other day about a plan to grow a lot of kelp over the Southern Ocean to suck up carbon dioxide. Uh, and there are various technology companies looking at, you know, sort of forcing air through turbines and chemically playing with the air and taking the carbon dioxide out of it. A lot of these, you know, they look good on paper and they've been tested at the sort of laboratory scale, but the cost and the energy use associated with scaling that up to a big enough scale to actually change the whole of the global atmosphere, at the moment, none of these look very feasible. And it's a bit like a, it's a sort of, uh, comes back to basic science again, you know, it's easy to scramble an egg, but it's almost impossible to unscramble an egg. Putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is easy, taking it out again <laughs> turns out to be quite hard. And the other, the other component of geoengineering is comes back to the amount of sunlight mostly. So, you know, I said that the amount of sunlight falls on the earth, the amount of greenhouse gas that controls the temperature. So we can block out more sunlight that will cool the earth. And there are some quite serious proposals to pump sulfates into the stratosphere to simulate a big volcanic eruption, essentially. We could pump this stuff into the stratosphere that would block out sunlight and that would cool the earth down. And it absolutely would. The only trouble is, um, it doesn't actually fix the problem. It adds to the problem. It would still there would still be changes in the way rain falls. The ocean water would still be becoming acidified because we'd still be putting more carbon into the, the oceans. And once you start that, you know, you're locked into it. If you pump the stuff into the stratosphere and cool the planet down by a degree or whatever, you've got to keep doing it forever and ever, because as soon as you stop, temperatures would rocket up if the carbon dioxide concentrations had gone up in the meantime. So it's a a real devil's bargain kind of thing. Once you get into it, you can't get out of it. I think the best geoengineering is just to turn off the tap of the carbon dioxide emissions, personally. Okay, we'll take one more question. Tony, you had your hand up there, sorry, Don. James, thank you. Very, uh, very sure. inspiring. Would you describe yourself as optimistic? If so, why? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I, do, I think about this question quite a lot, actually. Haven't quite got to the point of lying awake at night, but it gets close some days. Uh, yes, is my short answer. I think I might not be giving talks like this if, my, if I was not feeling optimistic. And I guess one of the great things for me is I've been, I've been at Victoria University for seven years. I was at NIWA and the Met Service before that. And I hadn't really thought about it, but being there puts me in front of all of these inspiring young people. The number of undergraduate students at Vic and other universities who are involved in activism and, and coming up with new ideas about things we can do for sustainability and so on, I find that really inspiring. So our generation has caused this problem, but the next generation or two are actually really actively thinking about what to do and how to configure our society and our economy differently 
I'm, I'm not trying to say it is an easy problem by any means. It's a terrifically hard problem, but I do find the attitude of young people today very inspiring. And I'll have to say, my son, who's 23, he became vegan about five years ago, and boy, does he give me a hard time for <laughs> eating the occasional meat pie. And so he's got this like zero waste lifestyle. And I just, I'm, I'm, I'm really in awe of it, but I just feel like there's no way I, I could do it. It's just, just not the way I've lived my life, I'm afraid. So I do eat less red meat than I used to and all the rest of it, and we had vegetarian weekend just gone. But I'm not sure I could be quite as onto it as he is. And yet, you know, a lot of people under the age of 25, say, have no problem with that kind of lifestyle, and things are changing. So that does give me a lot of hope. And, you know, humans are pretty ingenious creatures. We've come up with all sorts of amazing technologies in the past. I can't see the technology that will suck all this carbon dioxide out of the air, but then 20 years ago nobody could see smartphones or, you know, the internet particularly. So I'm ready to believe that we can find some technological solution that I'm completely unaware of today. I hope it happens. I'm not holding my breath. We need to get on with reducing emissions in the meantime, but yeah, I, I do have hope, and provided we all do something ASAP, that will continue to give me hope. James, thank you. Roger, would you like to come forward? Well, thank, thank you, James, for a very stimulating and inspiring uh, presentation, uh, which, as you pointed out, has been evidence-based, uh, science-based, not on belief. Uh, and optimistic in answer to uh, Tony's uh, question. I've taken uh, four take-home messages out of what James has been talking about. Uh, one, uh, we are entering a climate not seen for millions of years. Uh, two, that everything is changing. Uh, three, that uh, future change depends on the emissions that we allow to be emitted. And fourthly, the sooner we stop emitting, the sooner we stop climate change. And so the challenge is up to us. That's the, the message of tonight, I would think. Um, and James said, talk about it, think about solutions, and the inspiration seems to be coming from our young people. Our generations created the problem, our young people uh, setting about solving it. Perhaps we should be listening to our young people. So James, uh, we have a, um, a small present from Rotary Club. I'm sure it's low carbon.